Uh, for those of you, uh, if this is your first time with us today, thank you very much for being here. Um, we do something called Civic Duty Sunday uh, every four years at our church or every two years, depending on uh, the, the election season, obviously. And we have a very important elect. They're all important election seasons, by the way. Uh, but we have an important election coming up, not only federally, but state as well as local. And one of the things I want to do this morning uh, is talk to you a little bit about, during our exhortation, what an election sermon is. And you're going to notice here on the screen a, a print-up of an actual election sermon. Actually, I posted this just a few days ago. It's a sermon which was preached before His Excellency John Hancock, Governor, and His Honor Samuel Adams, and some of you are saying, the only Samuel Adams I know. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're an 805 guy. Lieutenant Governor, the, I'm sorry, the Honorable Council, Senate, and House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on May 26, 1790, being the day of general election by Daniel Foster, pastor of the Church of New Brantiff. Now, you say, why is this important to talk about? Because in our nation's 248 years, it was highly common for pastors to be invited to preach before those who are elected and those who have been elected Amen. and just before they're seated in their state, hall, state house or even the federal house. And here is a sermon that was preached by Daniel Foster. So again, right around the time of our nation's founding, it was very common practice for ministers to preach these election sermons. In fact, it was very common for a minister to be invited by elected officials from all the parties represented at the time to give a sermon before the newly elected government officials. The sermon cover, which I've just highlighted for you, was delivered by Reverend Daniel Foster and was preached before John Hancock, the governor of Massachusetts, and yes, ultimately that John Hancock, in front of both houses of legislature. The Reverend Daniel Foster, the text that he preached from, which ironically will be the text in part that I will be preaching from next Sunday morning, is Proverbs chapter 8, verse 16, which states these words, By me, princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. My heart today is that would to God... We had bold preachers today who would thunderously and clearly preach God's infallible word to all those who would both seek and are currently occupying higher office. Amen. And I want to say this to you. Our mandate from God's word to preach and to proclaim his word far outweighs any ordinance of man to the contrary. And I think it's important and, 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 and imperative for us to understand today, in 2024, that this preacher and others like me across the nation and around the world still preach what you would consider an election year sermon. And that is what you're going to get this morning in just a few moments. If you're a visitor today, you're in for a treat, maybe in for a bit of a shock. <laughs> but at the same time, Better to be shocked among friends than shocked among enemies. Amen? <laughs> Brother Ron, where are you? Youngest kids, I think, are dismissed this morning, right? Yes. Youngest are dismissed. The oldest are being staying with us. And uh, let me just uh, encourage you as you're here today, uh, if you have not voted, please do so. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable about mailing it in, then walk it in, please. Uh, but I would just encourage you to vote, even if it's the day of. Get your vote out. Take your Bibles, if you would, for those of you who can. Go to James chapter 4, verse number 17. James chapter 4, verse number 17. I believe also next Sunday is the final Trump train. 
uh, heading into the election. So that's next Sunday at 2 o'clock. James chapter 4, verse number 17. When you're there, say amen. If you're not there, you can always look at the screen and you could have said amen. Amen? There you go. James chapter 4, verse number 17. I'm going to jump into the context here because James is actually, in verse 17, coming to a climax or a crescendo of his argument that he starts in chapter 2 and continues in chapter 4 and then kind of culminates in verse 17 of chapter 4. But I'm going to use verse 17 as kind of our, our jumping off text for the sermon this morning. James chapter 4, verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In just a little over one week, voters will head to the polls and cast a vote in one of the most consequential elections in our lifetime. And while there is plenty of voter enthusiasm for this year's election on both sides, it is estimated that up to 30 million to 40 million evangelical Christians will not be voting at all. This should not be. Even if neither candidate strikes one's fancy, one should still vote for someone, or in the least, write in my name. <laughs> right, Mark? There you go. The question is this. The question is this. Why are 30 million plus self-professed Christians staying home instead of participating in their civic duty to affect the righteous direction of the country. And I would simply posit this, because many, if not all of, that, of those 30 million, do not see voting as a moral mandate that each citizen must engage in. This year's election sermon for 2024 is on the topic of the moral mandate to vote the moral mandate to vote. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to join in this place, thankful for these folks who have come out to hear this election year sermon, Father, to worship you and to fellowship with one another. Father, first and foremost, if there be somebody in our midst today that says, Preacher, I don't know that if I died today that heaven would be my home. Then, Father, I pray today, Lord, that you would burden their heart and help them to see their need for a Savior that their sins need to be forgiven, and it can only be forgiven by a righteous Savior. And Father, we pray that first and foremost. And then, Father, for those that are here for some guidance when it comes to the upcoming election, Father, we just pray this morning that you would help me in this message, Father, that I believe you've burdened my heart to preach, to make it clear that voting is a moral mandate, and I believe, Father, from the Word of God. We ask you, Father, that you give us clarity, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want you to consider our text this morning here in James chapter 4, verse number 17, where James says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, if I may paraphrase this verse without doing dishonor to the text, I believe this verse is saying, To him that knows what he ought to do, yet doesn't do it, to him it is sin. What we have described for us here in James chapter 4, verse 17, is something called a sin of omission, a sin of omission. Now you say, well, what is a sin of omission? I just remember my Catholic upbringing, a sin of omission, a sin of commission. Oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do? Well, this is a sin of omission. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it is when we neglect to do what we know is right, but don't do it. It's when we neglect to do what we know is right, but we don't do it. And, and frankly, can I say to you, we sin in this way every day, in every area of our lives. We sin this way in our marriages, unfortunately. We sin this way in our parenting, unfortunately. Uh, in our day-to-day -day relationships, we sin in this way, and even in business. 
We sin in this way, this sin of omission. That is, we willfully do not do what we know we ought to be doing. Not participating in one civic duty to redirect the course of your nation, I believe, can also be seen as a sin of omission. Now you say, now, why do I say this? And what is my biblical understanding for why I would premise it that way? Number one, I want you to think about this. The first reason why I believe that not engaging in your civic responsibility to vote can be a sin of omission is because, number one, God moved in the hearts and minds of our nation's founders that we would be a representative republic. Let me say that again. God moved, in, and I believe everything I'm about to tell you, God moved in the hearts and minds of our nation's founders that we would be a representative republic. Now, I preached a whole sermon on why we are a republic and not a democracy with Nathan Hockman sitting right there. And uh, I don't know how much of it he paid attention to, but the fact of the matter is we are a representative republic. We are a, a, a true democracy in the sense that we are a republic, and we're not a pure democracy the way it's being defined today. Now, it's also important to understand that we are not a monarchy. That is, uh, we are not ruled by a king. Now, sometimes the president might think they're king, but they're not king. One of the things that was uh, said about one of the kings of France uh, one of the kings of France said about George Washington when George Washington became the first president of the United States. The king of France was talking about how, why would a man like Washington, this is before Washington stepped down after his term of office, the king of France said, why would a man willfully give up this whole nation with all of its riches, with all of its people, with all of its natural resources, and sit down and let someone else take their place? And the king of France said, I'm willing to bet that Washington will not acquiesce and step out of the way. Guess what? Our presidents have been doing that for 248 years. Where they are elected for one term, sometimes two terms, and then they give it up and someone else comes in whether we like that person or not. But we're not a monarchy. We're not ruled by a king. We're not a democracy where we are ruled by mob rule or majority rule. This is why it's so important that we have an electoral college and a national popular vote. Because a national popular vote should not determine the president when Wyoming and Montana and other states like that don't have the population centers that California and New York have. This is why it's so important that our founders were so driven, I believe, by providence, that they believed that if majority rule was to be the rule in America, then that means that there would be huge places on the map that would have absolutely no voice at all. So we're not a democracy. We're not ruled by mob rule or majority rule. Number three, we're not an autocracy, which is the rule of one, like a dictator. We're not ruled by an autocracy. No, America was set up as a representative republic where to be a citizen is to be a governing official. Let me say that again. We are set up as a representative republic where to be a citizen of America, which is why it's so important that you become a citizen, that you are in fact a governing official. We are a government, according to the Constitution, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Amen. In a representative republic, the people function as one of the highest authorities in the land alongside the Constitution as we individually elect people to represent us. Those, elect, those elected govern with the consent and the authority of we the people, and we can either grant it to them or take it away from them. In America, every citizen is a part of the governing process and is morally culpable for how he or she uses that authority. I'm going to say that again. 
Every citizen is a part of the governing process and is morally culpable, responsible for how he or she uses that authority. Often Americans complain about the government. I've been one of those. But we forget that we are the government. Our country's problems begin with the people in the voting booth, not the people in Washington, D.C. So, why is voting a moral imperative? Because in America, as a representative republic, each citizen is himself or herself a governing official, each with a single vote that can affect the future of so many. And when someone willfully, with knowledge and foresight of their responsibility and authority, when someone willfully abdicates this God-given right, they are sinning. Because to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. I want to give you the second reason why I believe that there is a moral mandate to vote. The first is because God moved in the hearts and minds of our nation's founders that we would be a representative republic. The second reason is because we have a moral mandate to vote. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by a moral mandate to vote? I want you to look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And look at verses 36 through 40. We have a moral mandate to vote Because we love our neighbor. Let me say it again. We have a moral mandate to vote because we love our neighbor. Look at Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 and following. The Bible says this, But when the Pharisees had heard that he, Jesus, had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, uh uh-oh, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, what in the world does this mean? Listen, not only do I want the best for me and for my family when it comes to the election, but I want the best for my neighbor. Are we okay with that? You say, wait a minute, it's me, my four, and no more. That's selfish. I am not just looking out for myself According to Christian principles, I'm also looking out for others within my power. I mean, I can't control their lives, but I'm doing my best to look out for others. Therefore, when I enter the voting booth, I must choose the party and the platform that will best move the country in a godlier and more righteous direction. Now, because of this principle... I am not just looking out for the welfare of me and my family. I'm also considering the welfare and the well-being of my neighbor. The guy that's just to my right and the guy that's to my left and the guy that's across the street from me. And then, by extension, every citizen of this country. Therefore, I will vote for the party and I will vote for the platform that will take less of my personal wealth. I'm going to say that again because obviously you guys are not, you think you're an Episcopalian church, so you can't say anything. Uh, Therefore, I will vote for the party and the platform that will take less of my personal wealth. Therefore, I will vote for the party and the platform that will best uphold and honor life, both in the womb and outside of the womb. Therefore, I will vote for the party and the platform that will respect parents and will not side with a nine-year-old when it comes to gender-affirming care, puberty blockers, or the physical mutilation of the body for the sake of political expediency of the now. Therefore, I will vote for the party and the platform that will best keep marriage between one man and one woman till death do us part. 
Therefore, I will vote for the party and the platform that will best keep boys out of girls' sports and out of girls' locker rooms and restrooms other than the normal ways. Therefore, I will vote for the party and the platform that will best uphold my religious liberty and not force me to go against my conscience. Now, while I could go on, I think you got my point. You see, because in each one of those areas, whether it be my pocketbook, or whether it would be life in the womb or outside of the womb, or whether it would be the respect of parents, or whether it would be the platform of marriage, I'm not only looking out for my family and myself, I'm looking out for everybody else because I think those things are better for a society. See, these things not only serve me and my family and our best interest, but they also serve the best interest of my neighbor. Whether they realize it or not, it serves their best interest. I don't understand why anybody would think that it's better for someone to take more of my money than for me to keep more of my money. I don't know why anybody would think that a bunch of bureaucrats can define marriage for me when God has set it down in stone that it's between one man and one woman. I don't understand, and and nobody did either 10 years ago, that we would even have a debate about girls and boys in sports together. We even thought when I was in junior high, I remember one time we were playing flag football in junior high and we didn't have quite as many boys as we wanted because I was in a private school, it wasn't a very large school. And so we had a few girls and the boys were like, hmm. I don't like this. Except for this one kid, he liked this other girl. But, but other than that, the fact of the matter is, we didn't like that. We wanted to play flag football, so we want to play with boys. These things not only serve me and my family's best interest, but also the best interest of my neighbor. I have a moral mandate to vote because I not only want what's best for me and my household, I want what is best for my neighbor as well. And when we willfully and with complete foreknowledge abdicate that God-given right, we are sinning. Because the Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, I want to offer an objection, because there's always somebody that wants to be a contrarian during sermons like this. Not to suggest that anybody in this room would be a contrarian to anything I would have to say. But it's very possible that someone is sitting there chomping at the bit going, well, I don't really want to vote for the lesser of two evils. And I've used this argument, don't get me wrong, I've said this in the past, and I'm sure some of you have too. And maybe you're framing the election today between the two top tier candidates of a lesser of two evils argument. Now, some would argue that Christians should never vote for the lesser of two evils, because it's still evil. Look up here, look up here. Okay, so if you're 100% evil, and if you're 90% evil, you're still bad, amen? (laughs) All right? So, therefore, I must abstain from voting altogether. At least that's how the logic goes. However, the framing of this objection is unfair. The framing of this objection is unfair. When I am asked the question, can Christians vote for the lesser of two evils, the framing of that question demands the answer, no. Because obviously as a Christian, I shouldn't vote for any evil, whether it's most or less than. But I do not believe the question is helpful. Not even in this election between the two candidates we have against each other now. Think about it for a moment. When the Apostle Paul wrote Romans 13, which is all about government's role to us and our responsibility to government, Romans 13, which speaks of the role and function of government, Paul wrote this entire treatise on government 
amidst the tyrannical Roman Empire of his day that sought to kill him and other Christians. Now think about that. We read Romans 13 and we think, well, he's talking about 2024. No, he's talking about his day and he's talking about the emperor that was Roman his day. And I I promise you, you'd want Biden over Nero. You'd want the worst president we've ever had in our nation over Nero. Nero was bad. Last time I checked, no president that I'm aware of has doused you in kerosene and lit you on fire in their garden. Last time I checked. And so when Paul said that we're supposed to have a responsibility to those elected officials, he was writing during a time when the Roman Empire was tyrannical and was specifically targeting believers. So here's what I would say. If Paul could both write and encourage believers in his day to implement good amid the imperfections of the Roman government, why are we and our government any different today? The great Francis Schaeffer, I posted this the other day, the great Francis Schaeffer said this, quote, If we demand perfection or nothing in any area of life, we will always get nothing. I have pastor friends that have told me they are not going to vote for anybody. I'm like, you're not even going to write me in? I mean, not even me. I mean, your wife's name, somebody's name. I mean, why aren't you going to do something? And believe it or not, uh, these people are actually preaching that from the pulpit. Can I say something to you? Some of those congregations follow me on Facebook. And some of them know my number and will text me and say, I understand what he's saying, but I know who I'm voting for. Or at least I'm voting. Can I say something to you? I I think it's, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, I I don't think any pastor should ever come behind the pulpit and say, you should never vote. I think that is cowardice. I think that is not serving the congregation and is not allowing them to think for themselves and to use the tools that God has given you. So the great Francis Schaeffer said, if we demand perfection or nothing in any area of life, we will always get nothing. In short, it is impossible and terribly cruel to demand perfection from our fellow sinners. If we demand a perfect candidate, which by the way, we don't have, we never have, if we demand a perfect candidate and a perfect party, then we will get nothing every time if we sit it out every time. We are not looking for a political savior, but we are looking for the person who will wield the sword of the state with the most justice. So, in light of this reality, we must reframe our expectations. We are not looking for the lesser of the two evils. Rather, we are looking for the most righteous option. Let me say that again. We're not looking for the lesser of two evils. Rather, we are looking for the most righteous option. Isn't it amazing just reframing the the, the question changes the perspective? While the GOP, the grand old party, has many imperfections and problems, they are the more righteous option on virtually every major political issue of our day. And you know what's funny? If I preached this sermon 30 years ago, I wouldn't have to say half the things I'm saying because we weren't fighting some of the battles 30 years ago that we're fighting today. We didn't have to talk about child mutilation 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 22 years of our history of Freedom's Way. I never preached a sermon on parents not having the right to say no to their nine-year-old about whether or not they think they're Barbie or Ken right? I mean, that's ludicrous. We would have never thought about that 22 years ago. But in the last decade, lunacy has come over both political parties, one more than than the other, but both political parties. When we frame our political dilemma in this way, as a search for the most righteous option, it frees us from the unrealistic expectations and allows us a clearer path forward. 
And folks, I don't want to put on my political candidates unrealistic expectations that I know that even I as a pastor cannot live up to. And it's amazing that we're Christians, many of us are Christians, and we'll say, well, we believe the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior, but then we demand more of our politicians than we do yourself. Yeah. Folks, can I say something to you? Politicians are going to fail us. Right. Not every politician is going to make us feel like, mm, um, yeah, I'm always going to agree. I don't always agree with every politician, but I know one thing. I know which of the two on the top are the more righteous option. Let me summarize it by saying this. Christian, you have a moral imperative to vote in this election and, frankly, in every election hereafter. Why? Because to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You are not only thinking about you and your family, but you are also looking out for your neighbor because what's, what's good for your pocketbook is good for their pocketbook. What's good for the unborn child in your family is good for their unborn child in their family. In light of all you know this morning, in light of the fact that we are the government, that we are the government, and our individual vote is crucial, and yet you willfully refuse to do what you know is right, that is sin. And may God's will be brought about through your free will, to do what you know is right. Let me say that one more time. There's no contradiction here. May God's will be brought about through your free will to do what you know is right. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I heard a pastor tell me that it doesn't matter if I vote or not, God's, gonna, God's already got an outcome. Can I say something to you? That's called fatalism. You know what fatalism is? Everything is just fatalistically determined. So if that's the case, I guess God's the cause of abortion. Are we good? God's the cause of murder, chaos, and all. Look up here. I'm not a fatalist. I don't think that God has fatalistically, fatalistically determined these things. I believe that he has given us something called choice. Amen. You know what's interesting? I'll close with this illustration. And I, I could use any illustration from the Bible, but this is the one that pops to mind right now. God could have just picked up Jonah and placed him in Nineveh. Like this. God takes his giant hand, puts it down on Jonah's beanie head, picks him up, skips the whale, <laughs> and puts him down and says, you're going to preach to those Ninevites whether you like it or not. But instead, he allows Jonah to go through this human haw of a ship, and he even allows other people to kind of get in on it too. And then ultimately, prepares a great fish and swallows up Jonah. You say, well, wait a minute, but God ultimately gets what he wants. No, you're right. God ultimately gets what he wants, but guess what? That's because you line up with Him. Amen. You line up with Him. He doesn't line up with you. That's right. You line up with Him. Yes, he, God, is the eternal plumb line. Amen. You want to be plumb? You get in line with Him. Amen. If you want to be off balance, then do your own stinking thing That's right. every time, and you won't be plumb. Now, folks... God is not going to make you vote, and I'm not going to make you vote, but He's given you a choice in a country where He gave you some founding fathers that at least had a heart towards the God of the Bible and allowed God to use them to give us something here called the great United States of America. And it's up to remnant believers and remnant individuals to keep this experiment alive. And if it's not you, then who? That's right. That's right. May God's will be accomplished on November 5th through your free will choice.
Our gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look to your word. And Father, we ask you now, as we, Father, crescendo our service this morning, Father, I pray that everybody in this room is burdened in their heart. Lord, if they haven't voted yet, I pray they will. And Lord, do it soon. Don't set it aside. Father, do it. And Father, whether they choose to mail that in or whether they want to take it in or whether they want to vote on the day of, I, by all means, Lord, I just pray you'd burden their heart to vote. And Father, help us also to realize that if we put our faith and trust in any one other than you, we will always be discouraged and let down. Even, I'll be honest, Lord, in my walk with you, I've let you down many times, but Father, sometimes I think you've let me down, but I know in retrospect you didn't. But Lord, we need to put our faith and trust in, in you and not necessarily in elected officials, but Father, at the same time, we want to elect the official that is going to best represent and bring us closer to righteousness. Amen. And Father, that is what we need as a nation. The current trajectory, the current scientific analysis, the current trajectory of our nation is not healthy. And Father, we need a, a stemming of that. That can only happen if everybody, including the 30 million evangelicals who say they're Christians, but yet are going to sit this out, Father, burden and chastise their heart to get out there and vote. And Father, we ask you today, Father, for your will to be accomplished through our free will effort. For it's in Jesus Christ's name. Let's turn our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If you can stand this morning. If God's touched your heart today, maybe you'd like to come. Maybe you want to pray. Maybe you want to pray for your country. Maybe you want to pray for the outcome of the election. But at the same time, using last Sunday's sermon as a barometer, you want to pray specifically, but you also want to pray for God's will. As Brother Sherlock plays, you take this time.